said at the beginning of the service that it was honor, an honor to be here, and I want you to know that that's not just a full hour. I actually mean it. Uh, I've been wanting to get down here for some time. And Father Ed was, was absolutely determined, and I was with him, that I'd be here before he left. And so it just so happened with everything coming together at once that, of course, as you know, uh, visitation, confirmation, Father Edwards last Sunday, the Feast of All Saints all rolled into one. That's quite an agenda for one service. But they're connected in a way. So first of all, let's kind of work our way backwards. Feast of All Saints. The Feast of All Saints actually began in the early life of the church is that they, as they were remembering people who had died for their faith, the martyrs. And they would literally gather at the places where those had been buried and remember them and give thanks for the courage of their life and witness. But what began to happen during the persecution of Christians under the Roman Empire was that there got to be too many of them for them to try, to, they, they'd be going to graves all the time. And so out of that, it was consolidated into one very special day, and they called it All Saints Day. And so All Saints has its roots in remembering those who died from persecution for their faith. If you follow the news, you know that that has some particular weight for us now, because we do live at a time where there are Christians who, in fact, are dying for their faith in a number of parts of the world. And they are, as I said to those who are being prepared to be confirmed, especially with an Anglicanism, we're talking about our brothers and sisters, uh, Christians, Anglican Christians, who, in fact, have had their churches burned, had their livelihoods confiscated, have ended up often in prison, and some who have died for their faith. So this is a call to remember their courage and to remember their faithfulness. But it's also a time of resolve because as one of the songs in the hymn, hymnal goes about All Saints Day, uh, and I mean to be one too, talking about what it means to be a saint, it's a commitment that we make to say, if any kind of real difficulty comes with being a Christian, I'm not bailing. I'm making the commitment to be in, to make that commitment to Jesus and to stay faithful to Him regardless of whether my circumstances go well or whether they go badly, even in the extreme. There are Christians for whom they assume that if they make a commitment to Christ, then that means things will always go well for them. And therefore, when things go badly, they say, oh, what did I, I do wrong? Is God mad at me? But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus was very clear about the fact that to follow Jesus does not make you immune from difficulty. Instead, what it does is that when difficulty comes, he gives you the supernatural strength that you need to be able to get through it, undergirded by his love and by his faithfulness. Because he says to us, I will never leave you or forsake you. In other words, it's not, I'm with you when things go well, but I abandon you when things go badly. No, I will always be with you. I will never leave you. That is not qualified on any circumstance. In other words, the commitment of Jesus to his followers, to his Christians, is absolutely unconditional. He will be with us regardless of what it is that we go through. Doesn't mean we don't have to take responsibility when we're the cause for the trouble. But what it does mean is that he will give us what we need to be able to get through. That's really important when it comes for confirmation. Because if you watch closely when I confirm, and they know this is in fact going to happen to them, that I do three things when I confirm. The first thing is that I place my hands on their head, and that's a prayer for God's protection and for his care. Second thing I do is I take a little bit of oil. I make the sign of the cross on their forehead. Oil in the scriptures always is a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we're saying, Holy Spirit, touch these people. And then the third thing I do, and I promised that it wouldn't hurt, is that they get a little slap on the cheek. <laughs> that has to do with symbolically representing the fact that there will be times, if you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ, that it could be difficult for you because of your Christian commitment. Not because you're a difficult person, although that happens too, doesn't it? 
but instead no, specifically because of who you are as a Christian. And what you're saying in confirmation is, I'm making the commitment to follow Jesus, even if it costs me, even if it's difficult. All of that is important because more often than not, what actually wins non-Christians to Christ is when they see this courage, the transparency, and the faithfulness of Christian people, even when life gets difficult. It's easy to be faithful when things are going well, is it not? It's a little bit more difficult when things aren't going well. When we want to take the reins, <clears throat> and when we're unhappy with God, and we choose to walk away and say, as it were, I didn't sign up for this. And what I'm saying is, actually, you did. You did sign up for this. That's the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And there are, in fact, times when people are one to Christ because of the faithfulness of people in difficulty. A woman who walks with courage and grace and deep peace and faith, even as she is grieving because her husband, in an untimely way, was struck down by cancer. And people marvel at the great peace that she has in her life because she knows that her husband is going to go and be with the Lord and that the God was going to, is going to take care of her and watch out for her even as she grieves the loss of a husband that she loves. That's an extraordinary public and personal witness. And I, I could go on with different kinds of examples. I, I have a friend, for example, talking about almost the other extreme, who has a deep love for Christians in Pakistan. And she, for them, they, they are pe Christians especially in the midst of the regime that is there. If you're Christian, and especially if you're Christian and female, it, nobody pays attention to you. You have, you have no rights whatsoever. And therefore, she's been organizing efforts. In fact, she was a speaker at diocesan convention last year, organizing microenterprise development for women needing a job because they're female and because they're Christian. Nobody is interested in giving them a job. That's how we operate, you see. That's what it means to be a believer in Christ, which is why it seems to me these lessons for this morning are so incredibly important. Number one, I, turn with me in your leaflet. There are just a couple of very brief things I want to point out. And that is, what is, number one, what is the essence of our commitment? And then out of the epistle reading, and then number two out of the gospel reading, therefore, what kind of behavior should we be particularly careful to avoid? If you look at the last line of the Thessalonian reading, Paul writes these words. He says, We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it really is God's word, which is also at work in you believers. In other words, the essence of our Christian faith is that we really do believe the truth that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came in a very specific time in history that we can point to. In other words, it's not mythology. It's not Homer's Odyssey or the Iliad. It's not some kind of made-up fantasy story, Grimm's fairy tales. Instead, we're talking about an historic action in time where Jesus, as God in the flesh, appeared on, in human history, died on the cross for all of humanity, that he was who he said he was, I am resurrection and life, he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And that he himself holds the keys to both the answers of life as well as to the promise of eternity. He is who he says he is, God in the flesh, revealing the very nature of God to us. That's who we believe in. In other words, we're not mistaken. We're not deluded. The essence and the witness of Jesus' life attests in fact, to the clarity and the truth of who he is and what he did, both by his life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection from the dead. He is the name of this church. He is our Savior. Because he is all of those things. He can enter into the human heart. 
He can change the human heart from the inside out. He can bring forgiveness. He can promise the companionship of His presence. And that when we die, we know because of His promise, not because of our behavior, but because of His promise that we will be with Him forever in eternity. I don't know about you, but if I, if I believe that in the deepest part of who I am, there's a part of me that just exhales. I relax. That I have, in fact, God's love, His deep and profound care as my constant companion. And that even if I were to suffer an untimely death, or even if I were to live into my 90s, my mother's 91 right now, she's still thriving, I hope I have her genes, that she, and she knows that if she were to literally drop dead in her apartment, that she would immediately be ushered into the eternal presence of God to be with God forever. That's the assurance that we have. And the basis of that insurance has everything to do with the truthfulness of what Jesus says to us and what he demonstrated to us in his life, his miracles, his death, and resurrection. That's what Paul means. You accepted this not as a human word, but as it really is God's word, which is at work. In other words, it's in us. It's not just the subjective truth, but God is using that to literally touch the deepest parts of our own heart coming inside of us, into the places where no one else even knows to bring mercy and forgiveness. No condemnation. The release of shame. The healing of our wounds. The strengthening of us to live with courage and with purpose, regardless of what's happening in our circumstances. That's what, it, in its heart of hearts, is what it means to be a Christian. And that's the kind of Christians that this church this community and our world deeply needs because, believe me, we have a lot of Christians, not that that's true here in this church. I don't know you well enough to say that. By contrast, is what Jesus is pointing out in the Gospel reading. When he's talking about the hypocrisy of religious leaders. It's funny. Jesus would always go more than the extra mile to the hungry, broken sinner in need. The people who received the highest degree of condemnation and judgment were the religious leaders who, meet, who were hypocrites. And what that meant, what hypocrisy in the eyes of Jesus means at its heart of hearts, is that instead of living for God, they are living for other people's opinions. It's all a show. They want to be impressive. And they want other people to think well of them. And they literally create a persona by their behavior, by their dress, by their actions, by the titles that they accumulate for themselves so that they can be impressive. Have you ever met people like that? I have. They have a lot of swagger. But there's a part of you that walks away and goes, you know, I just don't trust you. That's your heart going, watch out. <laughs> what you're dealing with is not what's real on the inside. I mean, this is what Jesus says. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. And that's the thing that we actually should be watching out for as much as anything. Because if you understand that you walk in the companionship of God, in His deep acceptance, and in His love and care, that means He holds you in the palm of His hand. He cares for you more than any human being ever will. And that the promise of his love is profoundly and absolutely secure. But there is a part of us, is it not, that really does want to be seen well by others and to be liked and to be approved and to fit in and do all the things that are so much a part of what it means to be a human. And that's it. So what drives me as I think about these readings this morning is to be able to say, God, I know that all of that effort that's made to try to be impressive is actually a waste of time. You don't care about it. In fact, you actually don't even like it. Please do whatever it takes in me so that who I live for is not for other people's opinions. Who I live for is for you. I confess to you I don't know quite how to do that. I've been trained to be oppressive. So Jesus, give me your character so that I do not 
wind up looking like the people that are being described in this passage. You've done it for plenty of others. That's what All Saints is all about. You gave them courage and grace to live for you and to live for you only. So I need you to work that in me. If there's anything I want you to take away from this sermon, it's that. Because all of us wrestle with that need to be liked. Only Jesus can come and change our hearts in such a way that we live with a new kind of security. And it's because we know to whom we belong. We belong to Him who loves us and who will never let us go. So family of God at Church of Our Savior, I would ask of you that as we give thanks today for those who are being confirmed and pray for them, as we give thanks for Father Edward, who in many ways models some of the very best of what's described in these passages. I'm deeply indebted, Father Edward, but I'll save that to later. <laughs> I, I want to say to you that coming out of this service, what I would ask is to say, Oh Lord, help me to learn how to live in that prayer. Help me to learn how to serve you and not be so worried about what other people think. That I might live with courage, grace, and security to say as the hymn says, and I mean to be one too. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you do see us exactly as we are. That there is no pretense and you love us. You love us deeply and profoundly. So I pray for us, we who gather, that if there is anything inside of us that knows the sting of other people's rejections, that you would come and wait, come in here and take away that sting. That if there is the desire that is inside of us to be impressive and to be fearful of other people's rejections, that you would build in us a new kind of security. A security that comes from knowing that we are yours and that what matters most is your opinion, that we might live for you and that you do love and care for us. So we do pray that you would continue to open up our hearts and our minds to your presence, that we might live and reflect the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.